Welcome to this collection of four dark and thoughtful science fiction short stories. I'll be narrating Stalemate by Basil Wells, The Other Now by Murray Leinster, Dreamworld by R. A. Lafferty, and The Furious Rose by Dean Evans. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Stalemate by Basil Wells Narrated by William Skye The rules of a duel between gentlemen are quite different from the rules of war between nations. Is it because gentlemen do not fight wars, or is it that men in war cease to be gentlemen? The bullet slapped rotted leaves and dirt into Graham Treb's eyes. He wormed backward to the bowl of a small tree. Missed! he shouted. He used English, the second tongue of them both. Throw away your carbine and use rocks! You tasted it anyhow! Hal Nielsen's shrill young voice cried. How's the sample? That leaves you two cartridges, taunted Treb. Or is it only one? The sixth sense that had brought him safely through two of these bloody war jewels here in space made him fling his body to the left. He rolled over once and lay huddled in a shallow depression. He knew all the tiny hollows and ridges. They were his insurance on this mile-wide island high above Earth. Something thudded into the tree roots behind him. He hugged the ground, body flattened. His breath eased raggedly outward and caught. The waiting, the seconds that became hours. If the grenade rolled after him, down the slope into his shelter, he was finished. There was nothing he could do. His palms oozed sweat. The grenade exploded. It was like a fist slammed against his skull. He was numbed for a long instant. Then he checked. Unharmed. The depression had saved his neck this time. He wanted to shout at Nielsen, tell him he was down to a lone grenade, but that was poor strategy. Now he must withdraw, make Nielsen think him injured or dead, and trap him in turn. They were the last of the belligerents here within Earth's satellite. For two months, since what would be May on Earth, they had carried on this mad duel. Of the other eighteen who had started the war in November of the preceding year, only four had survived their wounds. The United Nations supervisory seconds had transported them to their homes in Andilia and in Barrett. Treb wormed his way as noiselessly as possible into the undergrowth, sprawling at last in the shelter of an earthen mound thirty feet from the grenade's raw splash. He waited and thought. Memories can be unpleasant. He could see his comrades of the three battles as they had fallen, wounded or grey with death. Too many of them had he helped bury. He remembered the treasured photos. The draining wound in his right forearm throbbed. The enemy dead too. He had killed several of them, more than his share, he thought savagely. They too were young, despite the ragged beard some of them cultivated. Treb felt like an old man. And he was old. He was twenty-nine. He had a son, also named Graham, a boy of five. And little Alza, who was two. Had little Alza's mother lived... He would never have volunteered for this third United Nations war duel. He would have been with her in the mountain valley of Krekar, working hard and gradually erasing those other ugly episodes here on Earth Satellite One. Minutes crawled by, lumped together into hours. Birds sang in the trees so laboriously maintained here in the satellite's disc-shaped heart. And a hundred feet overhead, where the true deck of the man-made island in space began, other birds nested in the girders. An ant crawled over Treb's earth-stained hand and passed under his outstretched carbine's barrel. There was a movement in the clustering trees off to his right. Nielsen had circled and was coming in from an opposite angle. Treb thumbed off the safety and waited. An earth-coloured helmet with a trace of long pale hair around its rim came slowly into view. Could be a dummy. Nielsen was clever at rigging them to draw fire. And he had exactly two cartridges. After that, it would be his three grenades, his two-foot needle knife that doubled as a bayonet, and the steel bow he had contrived from a strip of spring steel. He held his fire. The trees made grenade lobbing a touchy business, and his bow was back in one of the dozens of foxholes he had spotted in both the inner and outer rings of trees. In the fantasy stories of adventure in space that he enjoyed reading, the hero could always whip up a weird paralysis ray, a deadly invisible robot bullet, or an intelligent gaseous ally from the void would appear and out of scrap glass, metal and his shoestrings, he could contrive a solar-powered shell that stopped any missile deadlier than a marshmallow cold. 
In actual life, he was finding it difficult enough to contrive a primitive sort of bow, a knife-lashed spear and snares for the increasingly wary rabbits. Lack of sleep and lack of food supplies were sapping his lanky body of the whiplash swiftness and wiry strength it once possessed. Nor was the weak old wound any aid to his dulled wits. The helmet advanced. He could almost see the twig's stuffed grey shirt's pockets, and he let his nostrils expand as he sucked in a steadying breath. Now, a yard behind the fake Andillion, he could see the moving shoulders and skull of Hal Nielsen. Also, his bloodshot eyes told him. He squeezed the trigger. There was a subdued yip and then a derisive jeer. Missed again. Or had he? Sour rocketing grandpa, Nielsen laughed. Try again, and then I'm coming after you. Only Nielsen wouldn't. Unless he'd miscalculated the number of grenades, he wouldn't come charging at Treb. And he couldn't be sure of the number of cartridges Treb possessed. He was just talking to keep his nerve up. Especially if he was wounded now. That sudden yip. It was night again. An artificial night, as artificial as the central ten-acre pool of water, the ring of flowering green trees and grasses, and the final outer ring of forest trees. It was here that the 2,000 UN employees and soldiers on Earth Satellite 1 normally took their recreation periods. Only the supervised war duels, that since 1969 had been the only bloodletting permitted between nations, could long keep a Terran from visiting the green meadows and trees of this lowest of the three levels. I'd give half that quarter million, Nielsen groaned across the darkness, for a cigarette. You mean, corrected Graham Treb, half your ten thousand... It's the winner's grant or nothing, Treb. I promised Jane I'd hand it to her. Then we'll marry. But not if you're the loser. I wouldn't. She wouldn't. It's impossible to think of asking her to share poverty and disgrace. I'd hardly say that. We lost our first war here on the satellite. Barrett was obligated to cede a thousand square miles to Tarrant's. Most of my ten thousand paid off my family's debts. Yet I married. I married Nal, who had nursed me back to health. And we were happy until the second war with Duristan. I wanted money for her, for the children, for my impoverished valley. Treb broke off. He backed away several feet and shifted noiselessly to a new position. Every night, and sometimes in the artificial sunlight, they talked together, but they never forgot that they were sworn foes. So you won it, didn't you? From his voice, Nielsen had shifted closer and to the left. Sure, and I wish I were as poor as before. For Nell was kicked to death by the horse I should have been using while I fought here. Nielsen made a sympathetic sound. Treb felt his lips twitch into a thin, crooked line. This is what it meant to be human. To feel sorrow for another man's misfortunes, and then kill him. Sure, Nielsen was a good sort. Only twenty-four and in love with a girl, a woman really, widow of a dead lunar explorer. And he was a clean living sort, nothing dishonourable or hateful about him. They even honoured the same god. But tomorrow, or the next day, or a month from now, he would kill or wound Nielsen, unless, as might well happen, Nielsen got to him first. He pushed aside a thought that came more and more often of late. Why not surrender, or let Nielsen capture him? He did not consider suicide. Little Graham and Ulsa needed him, although he had not been thinking of them when he signed for this ugly miniature battle in space. His wife's death had been too vivid yet. But why not surrender? He had enough money. The valley people could struggle along without the machines and the dam he had hoped to grant them with victory. And Barrett could lose the island of Darfa to Andelia without crippling herself. The 350 inhabitants could be transferred to the mainland. Treb laughed silently, a laugh that cut off with a twinge of drawing ugly pain from his wounded forearm. He knew that he could no more surrender without a fight than he could command his breathing to stop forever. He was a man, and men cannot give up dishonourably. I'd like to see those two kids sometime, if you're still around, Treb. Nielsen had moved again. His voice was lower, but he was nearer. Stop around any time, Harl. Treb moved a few feet deeper into a thicket. We'll show you what real Barrett hospitality is. That's a promise, Treb. Killing. That's what war was. So you had to kill, or you volunteered to kill but he didn't have to like it. All these little wars under UN supervision were needless. Arbitration would serve as well. But the people, the leaders, someone, wanted blood. So ten or twelve or fifteen citizens of one nation fought an equal number of the other state's sons. 
Doubtless it was an improvement over the mass bombings of innocent city dwellers and the horror of atomic dusts and sprays. No overwhelming army could sweep unchecked over a helpless neighbour. It was fairer, too, for those involved. Equal numbers of men, guns, supplies. Wealth if your side won, and a fair sum if you lost. The United Nations saw to that. After all the avenues to peaceful settlement had been explored and turned down, they finally permitted bloodshed. Much against their better judgement, perhaps. So he could destroy likeable young Andillians like Nielsen. Why don't you send up a rocket? Nielsen kidded, his voice coming from a changed direction again. So I can see you. Anything to oblige. Nielsen was circling out around, as though to drive him into a trap or trick him. They were getting back to the primitive now. Soon it would be knives, spears and deadfalls. Come on over and I'll show you Jane's picture, Treb, invited Nielsen. He laughed hoarsely. If we weren't where we are, I'd mean that. I know. I feel that way myself sometimes. We've been here alone too long. Hate hasn't lasted. Why aren't you a wrong old Treb? The young voice was cracked and savage. Why do you have to tell me about Graham and Alza? Treb was backing away again, cautiously. He scented a trap. No doubt Nielsen's words were sincere, at the moment, but in a second's time he could change into a cold-blooded executioner. He knew. He had seen the gentlest of men suddenly turn killer. And then his foot struck a yielding branch and his aroused suspicion sent him lunging forward. A heavy something fell with a sickening thud, brushing as it struck the sole of his disintegrating shoe. A cleverly rigged deadfall of small trees and rock, doubtless. You're slipping, Harl, he shouted. But he could feel the sudden sweat damping his palms and the muscles twitched unsteadily in his arms and across his stomach. With morning, he was half a mile away, in a foxhole less than sixty yards from the massive outer perimeter of the arena. Two of his snares had yielded a rabbit each, and so he was supplied for several days. The foxhole had two entrances, both well concealed, and he had rigged elaborate warning devices should the vicinity be approached. So he was sleeping. His dreams were unpleasant. In his latest dream, an extremely shapely and smiling young woman with dark hair was heaving a grenade into a pit where he lay bound and helpless. The grenade swelled until it became a spaceship heading directly toward the frail scout craft he piloted. And a tiny blob of dislodged mud from the dugout spat at his face. He sat up. Another day to hunt or be hunted, or to lie here and try to rest and make plans. There was slight possibility that Nielsen could find him here. He gnawed at the scantly fleshed ribs of the first rabbit, savouring the raw meaty smell and flavour. Hunger was his salt. Now that they had lost contact with one another, it might require several days to find Nielsen. A wooded platter, a mile in diameter, can afford many hiding places for one creature hiding from another hunting beast. It was time to set some of the traps he had been contriving. There were the two nooses, attached to bent-down triggered young trees that could not be set until darkness fell again. The net, too, would need darkness to conceal the four rough pulleys and the rocks that a tug on his rope would spill. But the almost invisible nylon cords, set at ankle height across the paths, and the ugly little pits with their sharpened stakes set three feet below could trip up a man and cripple him. He must put out several of those. He had no wish to kill Nielsen. If he could capture him, very good. He could go back to Andelia, and perhaps his Jane would be glad to take him. If she did not, it was worth knowing how little she really cared, was it not? So he would try to trap the younger man and save his life. It would be difficult. The other man had grenades, a carbine, and a keen needle knife. Perhaps before the end he would be forced to kill after all, but regretfully. Treb dumped the last of the Tsafa antibiotic into his wound and lay back for a few more hours of rest before going out to prepare the traps. His head was not clear, and his eyes drew together from exhaustion. Another night and another day, and it was night again. His traps were set and ready. All through the day he had prowled the trees, watching for some sign of Nielsen. He found he was muttering to himself, hungry for the sound of spoken words. It was nervous work. His muscles were jumping in faint, spastic explosions. Nielsen could have been lying in ambush in any of a hundred leafy coverts, resting there and waiting. He had covered less than two miles of inching, crawling paths, his eyes ever alert for deadfalls, pits and spear traps that might flash across the way to impale him. And he had caught no sight of Nielsen. Now it was night again. Time to check on his traps the rabbit traps as well as the human traps. He was approaching the net. 
and the awareness that this furtive game of hide-and-seek might go on for weeks oppressed him. He might lie here, close by the net for days without sight of Nielsen. They were too evenly matched, and Nielsen was younger. It was Nielsen's youth against his experience. He found the thin rope of knotted nylon and plastic scraps that led to the four balanced rocks. One stout yank and the net would jerk upward four feet and tighten around its victim. But, in the dim starlight from the small globes spotting the satellite ceiling, the path was an indistinct blur, a moving body's exact position, and at fifty feet, he saw Nielsen, it could only be Nielsen. Moving on hands and knees, he was keeping low and to the side of the little used trail, but within the width of the hand-patched net, and he moved slowly, probing before him with a stick or his needle knife, Treb could not tell which. Another two feet and he could trip the net, Nielsen would be captured alive, and the stalemate ended. Now! The net flung into the air, snapped tight about Nielsen's thrashing body. He heard the pop of parting strands as Nielsen slashed with his knife, and then he swung the butt of his carbine twice against the trapped man's skull. Nielsen went limp. It was finished. He could take his prisoner to the lock, summon the UN guards, and go home to the Krakar Hills, and an end to all bloodletting for him. He set about binding tight the arms and legs of Nielsen, and had barely completed his task when the prisoner groaned and struggled. So this is it, Treb. Yes. You win again, and I... I lose everything. So? Treb touched his pocket torch to a heap of shredded dry twigs. What have you lost? Your health? Your life? And will not the woman forget all else and love you? Ha! She will laugh at me if I come near her. Defeated, and with a paltry ten thousand to offer. Better that I died than this. Perhaps you do not know this woman, Harl. If she is good, she will come to you. The growing firelight was on Nielsen's bearded face, and beneath his eyes something glistened and beaded. He laughed bitterly. She's not good, Treb, understand that. She's evil and money-hungry, and ambitious. But she is beautiful, and I love her. I'd sell my soul and my body to possess her. That's why I volunteered. With the winner's grant I would have money, prestige, honour. There would be a thousand new opportunities for a career and Jane could not refuse me then. It is wrong, Hal Nielsen, to so worship a woman. Like alcohol or venerian fire pollen, it is unnatural. I know. I have tried to forget, to put her memory aside. But it is like a disease, an incurable disease. I must have Jane. Treb threw more wood on the little fire and checked over the lashings about Nielsen's body. I am going to look at my rabbit snares, he said, and to spring the other traps. We will eat and sleep and in the morning try to shave and look decent before going to the locks. Nielsen let his head sag between his shoulders and said nothing. He was leaning against a tree, his arms lashed behind him and to it. There is one more thing, Harl, that I wish to discuss. It is about the Paul Hubble Foundation Award. Think about it. Treb moved off into the darkness. The sunlight from the overhead suns of the satellite revealed a greatly changed Treb. He was shaved, his hair combed and hacked off above his ears, and he was stitching the last rough patch on his dark green trouser leg. Now he donned the trousers and went over to the bound dandelion. He cut the ropes, his carbine ready. Get down to the lake, he ordered. You'll find a razor, soap and an old shirt to dry yourself with. Hal Nielsen was chunky and fair-haired, with a healthy-looking red-brown skin. His eyes were wide and darkly blue. Now the wide mouth under his shapeless nose twisted into a faint grin. I'll try to get away, he warned. Aren't you afraid of that? I have all the guns, grenades and needle knives, Hal. I'll shoot you if you attempt to escape, of course, but I hope you'll listen to what I propose first. Nielsen slowly stripped off his ragged tunic and trousers. There was the scar of a recent bullet's path across his right shoulder blade. It was crusted with blackened blood. I thought I heard you two days back, Hal, said Treb. Just a scratch. Nielsen took up the soap and waded into the nearby lake. Start talking, Treb. I told you to think about Paul Hubble's award, Hall. He's the American industrialist who opposed violence in settling any issue. Sure, heard about him in the lower grades. Fifty million dollars he sunk in his worthless peace foundation. What about it? Hear me out. Did you like what we just went through? Your friends and comrades dying, my friends dead and wounded and all to settle some territorial dispute or to wipe out some imagined slur. Would you like to prevent your kid, or mine, from having to face this again? 
Stop sounding off, Treb, and say something, Nielsen scrubbed vigorously. Of course I would. If I ever had a kid, I mean. We could help Harl, by calling off the duel and making peace right here. Of course, there might be new balloting, even another battle between our countries. But we would crack the theory that victory means more than humanity. Nielsen snorted. He splashed water into his eyes and over his soapy beard and hair. And go home penniless, to have every friend and neighbour avoid us. What's eating you? You won. You'll get the quarter of a million. I want you to share equally. I want our two countries to know that friendship means more than glory. I don't get it. If neither side wins, we get nothing. You forget about the Hubble Award. Two hundred thousand to each member of both sides, or their survivors, if they declare an armistice. I had forgotten. You'd give up fifty thousand so I could get the same two hundred thousand. You're a prince, Treb. But I couldn't do it. Jane would turn against me. The radio, the newswires, television and the magazines would crucify me. Both of us. We'd ride it out. None of the participants in the twenty-two jewels here in Satellite has had the courage to admit he hates war. In years to come, our stand would be honoured. It means losing Jane. I can't do it. You've lost her anyway, Hal, if she's the way you say. How about your three wounded buddies, Wasson, Clark and Thomason? Badly cut up, aren't they? Clark blind, Wasson with no arms. Couldn't they use the two hundred thousand? Nielsen was coming ashore. A sudden resolve hardened his face and his blue eyes were dark and angry. His jaw jutted through the sandy fairness of his draggled beard. Treb felt his vitals knot at what he sensed in Nielsen's expression. He'd gambled on the essential fairness and sympathy of the Andillian's character. But now? I'll do it, Nielsen said tonelessly. I hope you'll never regret what you were doing, Harl. Oh, lock valves, snarled Nielsen. Get ready to go while I finish shaving. So that was the way it was to be. Treb turned wearily away. He went back through the screen of flowering shrubs and trees to where the coals of their fire turned grey. The grenades in the three cartridges, his own and Nielsen's, he buried in a hasty hole under a tree's sprawled roots. Afterward he tamped sod back into place and spread leaves. His needle knife he laid on the turf. From his pocket he took a long strip of cloth and some of the tough nylon cords from the net. Then he let his trousers drop about his ankles and set about anchoring the needle knife securely to his upper leg. When he had finished, the keen blade projected a foot below his kneecap, and around it, carefully, he wound some of the cloth. He donned his battered trousers again. The concealed knife was well hidden, although it did impede the freedom of his stride. Then he went down to rejoin Nielsen. Nielsen was just finishing hacking at his hair with a short-bladed safety razor. He scowled at Treb, his eyes on the carbine that the man from Barrett yet carried. Not taking any chances, eh, Treb? Just in case you change your mind, Hal. My friend, my very dear friend, Graham Treb, Nielsen laughed. What trust, what a faith in human nature. Yes, Hal, your friend. They left the lake behind, Nielsen in advance. Directly ahead, beyond the outer ring of trees, the locks to the upper levels waited. They had less than a third of a mile to traverse. The rusting, shattered debris of a machine gun with a spilled clutter of empty shell cases lay just off the trail. Harrock Dan died here, said Treb. Nielsen did not turn. The big man, Man Ross, was killed by Dan's fire even as he threw the grenade, he added. Treb was watching the broad-shouldered figure ahead. Shut it off, Treb, will you? Nielsen shouted, turning. Isn't it tough enough without you yap-yapping all the way? Treb's lips thinned. The knife chafed his leg. Already he was limping slightly. But they had covered more than half the distance. Once they contacted the UN guards and were through the locks, he could relax. The circular outer face of the lock was before them, and the button that summoned the guards jutted redly from a shoulder-high recess. Nielsen leaned against the lock, his narrowed eyes on Treb as he reached for the button. Treb jabbed, and he relaxed inwardly. Too late now for Nielsen to attempt overpowering him in claiming the victory. He had feared such an attempt, with the lust for the woman, Jane Van, driving him. Nielsen might have gone back on his word. It was tough going for the kid, but he wasn't losing anything worth keeping. And hundreds of fine young lads like him might be spared going through this ordeal in space. They'd, Nielsen's fist caught him behind the ear. That split second of inattention was proving costly. Nielsen clamped the carbine barrel, wrested it away from Treb. He raised it. Treb lifted his hands. 
So now it's me at the controls, Nielsen said, grinning. Any reason why I should go through with your Hubble Award idea? The guards will be here in no more than a minute, Harl. Throw the gun away and we'll go through together. Nielsen's eyes were shining. He was seeing the crowds waving crazy welcome as his spaceship grounded. He was seeing the adulation of the boys and the adoring glance of the dark-eyed girl named Jane. He was seeing the medals and the banquets and the bundles of money. You were crazy, Treb, he said, to ever trust me. In war promises mean nothing. Study your history. Treb squared his shoulders. His hands came down. If that's the way it is, he said, and then, Coming at you, Nielsen. Nielsen flinched. It was the first time Treb had called him by his last name. Perhaps that was the reason. Or it could have been the sight of an unarmed man walking directly into his carbine's ugly muzzle. He pressed the trigger. The unloaded weapon was silent. Treb wrenched at the gun. Nielsen kicked him in the crotch. The gun came free. He brought it down at Treb's head, but at the last second before impact, Treb dodged. The barrel smacked into Treb's right shoulder and broke the collarbone. Treb came on, his left hand jabbing and his right arm dangling. Nielsen chopped at his face with the vertically held carbine and tore a great chunk from his left cheek. And then Treb's knee came up. The shielded razor-sharp blade sliced through his trouser. He drove the ugly little dagger into Nielsen's body. Nielsen went down, squirming away from the sudden pain that tore at his vitals. The carbine went clattering. Treb knelt beside him, tried to staunch the warm gush of red life, and cursed soundlessly the ambition that is mankind's greatest boon and curse. He tore off the bloody knife. You won't die, Nielsen, he said gravely. Not with the surgeon and the hospital here on Earth satellite so near. You'll live to see Andilia again. And about the invitation to visit us. I'm sorry you rejected it like this, but the offer still stands. When I can call you Harl again. When you're a man, visit us. The lock behind them creaked and started to open. The Other Now by Murray Leinster Narrated by William Skye He knew his wife was dead because he'd seen her buried, but it was only one possibility out of infinitely many. It was self-evident nonsense. If Jimmy Patterson had told anybody but Haynes, calm men in white jackets would have taken him away for psychiatric treatment, which undoubtedly would have been effective. He'd have been restored to sanity and common sense, and he'd probably have died of it. So to anyone who liked Jimmy and Jane, it is good that things worked out as they did. The facts are patently impossible, but they are satisfying. Haynes, though, would like very much to know exactly why it happened in the case of Jimmy and Jane and nobody else. There must have been some specific reason, but there's absolutely no clue to it. It began about three months after Jane was killed in that freak accident. Jimmy had taken her death hard. This night seemed no different from any other. He came home just as usual, and his throat tightened a little, just as usual, as he went up to the door. It was still intolerable to know that Jane wouldn't be waiting for him. The hurt in his throat was a familiar sensation which he was doggedly hoping would go away. But it was extra strong tonight, and he wondered rather desperately if he'd sleep, or if he did, whether he would dream. Sometimes he had dreams of Jane and was happy until he woke up, and then he wanted to cut his throat. But he wasn't at that point tonight. Not yet. As he explained it to Haynes later, he simply put his key in the door and opened it and started to walk in. But he kicked the door instead, so he absently put his key in the door and opened it and started to walk in. Yes, that is what happened. He was halfway through before he realised. He stared blankly. The door looked perfectly normal. He closed it behind him, feeling queer. He tried to reason out what had happened. Then he felt a slight draught. The door wasn't shut. It was wide open. He had to close it again. That was all that happened to mark this night off from any other, and there is no explanation why it happened, began, rather, this night instead of another. Jimmy went to bed with a taut feeling. He'd had the conviction that he opened the door twice, the same door. Then he'd had the conviction that he had had to close it twice. He'd heard of that feeling, queer but no doubt commonplace. He slept blessedly without dreams. He woke next morning and found his muscles tense. That was an acquired habit. Before he opened his eyes every morning, he reminded himself that Jane wasn't beside him. It was necessary. If he forgot and turned contentedly to emptiness, the ache of being alive when Jane wasn't was unbearable. This morning he lay with his eyes closed to remind himself and instead found himself thinking about that business of the door. 
He'd kicked the door between the two openings, so it wasn't only an illusion of repetition. He was puzzling over that repetition after closing the door when he found he had to close it again. That proved to him it wasn't a standard mental vagary. It looked like a delusion. But his memory insisted that it had happened that way, whether it was possible or not. Frowning, he went out and got his breakfast at a restaurant and rode to work. Work was blessed because he had to think about it. The main trouble was that sometimes something turned up which Jane would have been amused to hear, and he had to remind himself that there was no use making a mental note to tell her. Jane was dead. Today he thought a good deal about the door, but when he went home he knew that he was going to have a black night. He wouldn't sleep, and oblivion would seem infinitely tempting, because the ache of being alive, when Jane wasn't, was horribly tedious, and he could not imagine an end to it. Tonight would be a very bad one indeed. He opened the door and started in. He went crashing into the door. He stood still for an instant, and then fumbled for the lock, but the door was open. He'd opened it. There hadn't been anything for him to run into. Yet his forehead hurt where he'd bumped into the door which wasn't closed at all. There was nothing he could do about it, though. He went in. He hung up his coat. He sat down wearily. He filled his pipe and grimly faced a night that was going to be one of the worst. He struck a match and lighted his pipe and put the match in an ashtray, and he glanced in the tray. There were the stubs of cigarettes in it, Jane's brand, freshly smoked. He touched them with his fingers. They were real. Then a furious anger filled him. Maybe the cleaning woman had had the intolerable insolence to smoke Jane's cigarettes. He got up and stormed through the house, raging as he searched for signs of further impertinence. He found none. He came back, seething to his chair. The ashtray was empty, and there'd been nobody around to empty it. It was logical to question his own sanity, and the question gave him a sort of grim cheer. The matter of the recurrent oddities could be used to fight the abysmal depression ahead. He tried to reason them out, and always they added up to delusions only. But he kept his mind resolutely on the problem. Work during the day was a godsend. Sometimes he was able to thrust aside for whole half-hours the fact that Jane was dead. Now he grappled relievedly with the question of his sanity or lunacy. He went to the desk where Jane had kept her household accounts. He set the whole thing down on paper and examined it methodically, checking this item against that. Jane's diary lay on the desk blotter, with a pencil between two of its pages. He picked it up with a tug of dread. Some day he might read it, an absurd chronicle Jane had never offered him. But not now. Not now. That was when he realised that it shouldn't be here. His hands jumped, and it fell open. He saw Jane's angular writing, and it hurt. He closed it quickly, aching all over. But the printed date at the top of the page registered on his brain, even as he snapped the cover shut. He sat still for minutes, every muscle taut. It was a long time before he opened the book again, and by that time he had a perfectly reasonable explanation. It must be that Jane hadn't restricted herself to assigned spaces. When she had something extra to write, she wrote it on past the page allotted for a given date. Of course. Jimmy fumbled back to the last written page where the pencil had been, with a tense matter-of-factness. It was, as he'd noticed, today's date. The page was filled. The writing was fresh. It was Jane's handwriting. Went to the cemetery, said the sprawling letters. It was very bad. Three months since the accident and it doesn't get any easier. I'm developing a personal enmity to chance. It doesn't seem like an abstraction any more. It was chance that killed Jimmy. It could have been me instead, or neither of us. I wish. Jimmy went quietly mad for a moment or two. When he came to himself, he was staring at an empty desk blotter. There wasn't any book before him. There wasn't any pencil between his fingers. He remembered picking up the pencil and writing desperately under Jane's entry. Jane, he'd written, and he could remember the look of his scrawled script under Jane's. Where are you? I'm not dead. I thought you were. In God's name, where are you? But certainly nothing of the sort could have happened. It was delusion. That night was particularly bad, but curiously not as bad as some other nights had been. Jimmy had a normal man's horror of insanity, yet this wasn't, so to speak, normal insanity. A lunatic has always an explanation for his delusions. Jimmy had none. He noted the fact. Next morning he bought a small camera with a flashbulb attachment and carefully memorised the directions for its use. This was the thing that would tell the story, and that night when he got home, as usual after dark, he had the camera ready. He unlocked the door and opened it. He put his hand out tentatively. 
The door was still closed. He stepped back and quickly snapped the camera. There was a sharp flash of the bulb. The glare blinded him. But when he put out his hand again, the door was open. He stepped into the living room without having to unlock and open it a second time. He looked at the desk as he turned the film and put in a new flash bulb. It was as empty as he'd left it in the morning. He hung up his coat and settled down tensely with his pipe. Presently he knocked out the ashes. There were cigarette butts in the tray. He quivered a little. He smoked again, carefully not looking at the desk. It was not until he knocked out the second pipe full of ashes that he let himself look where Jane's diary had been. It was there again. The book was open. There was a ruler laid across it to keep it open. Jimmy wasn't frightened, and he wasn't hopeful. There was absolutely no reason why this should happen to him. He was simply desperate and grim when he went across the room. He saw yesterday's entry and his own hysterical message, and there was more writing beyond that, in Jane's hand. Darling, maybe I'm going crazy, but I think you wrote me as if you were alive. Maybe I'm crazy to answer you, but please, darling, if you are alive somewhere and somehow... There was a tear blot here. The rest was frightened and tender, and as desperate as Jimmy's own sensations. He wrote with trembling fingers before he put the camera into position and pressed the shutter control for the second time. When his eyes recovered from the flash, there was nothing on the desk. He did not sleep at all that night, nor did he work the next day. He went to a photographer with the film and paid an extravagant fee to have the film developed and enlarged at once. He got back two prints, quite distinct, even very clear considering everything. One looked like a trick shot, showing a door twice, once open and once closed, in the same photograph. The other was a picture of an open book, and he could read every word on its pages. It was inconceivable that such a picture should have come out. He walked around practically at random for a couple of hours, looking at the pictures from time to time. Pictures or no pictures, the thing was nonsense. The facts were preposterous. It must be that he only imagined seeing these prints. But there was a quick way to find out. He went to Haynes. Haynes was his friend, and reluctantly a lawyer. Reluctantly, because law practice interfered with a large number of unlikely hobbies. Haynes, said Jimmy quietly. I want you to look at a couple of pictures and see if you see what I do. I may have gone out of my head. He passed over the picture of the door. It looked to Jimmy like two doors, nearly at right angles, in the same door frame and hung from the same hinges. Haynes looked at it and said tolerantly, Didn't know you went in for trick photography. He picked up a reading glass and examined it in detail. A futile but highly competent job. You covered half the film and exposed with the door closed, and then exposed for the other half of the film with the door open. A neat job of matching, though. You've a good tripod. I held the camera in my hand, said Jimmy with restraint. You couldn't do it that way, Jimmy, objected Haynes. Don't try to kid me. I'm trying not to fool myself, said Jimmy. He was very pale. He handed over the other enlargement. What do you see in this? Haynes looked. Then he jumped. He read through what was so plainly photographed on the pages of a diary that hadn't been before the camera. Then he looked at Jimmy in palpable uneasiness. Got any explanation? asked Jimmy. He swallowed. I haven't any. He told what had happened to date, boldly and without any attempt to make it reasonable. Haynes gaped at him. But before long, the lawyer's eyes grew shrewd and compassionate. As noted hitherto, he had a number of unlikely hobbies, among which was a loud insistence on a belief in a fourth dimension and other esoteric ideas, because it was good fun to talk authoritatively about them. But he had common sense, had Haynes, and a good and varied law practice. Presently he said gently, If you want it straight, Jimmy, I had a client once. She accused a chap of beating her up. It was very pathetic. She was absolutely sincere. She really believed it, but her own family admitted that she'd made the marks on herself and the doctors agreed that she'd unconsciously blotted it out of her mind afterward. "'You suggest,' said Jimmy composedly, "'that I might have forged all that to comfort myself with, "'as soon as I could forget the forging. "'I don't think that's the case, Haynes. "'What possibilities does that leave?' Haynes hesitated a long time. He looked at the pictures again, scrutinising especially the one that looked like a trick shot. "'This is an amazingly good job of matching,' he said wryly. "'I can't pick the place where the two exposures join.' Some people might manage to swallow this, and the theoretic explanation is a lot better. The only trouble is that it couldn't happen. Jimmy waited. Haynes went on awkwardly. The accident in which Jane was killed. You were in your car. You came up behind a truck carrying structural steel. 
There was a long, slim girder sticking way out behind with a red rag on it. The truck had air brakes. The driver jammed them on just after he'd passed over a bit of wet pavement. The truck stopped. Your car slid even with the brakes locked. It's nonsense, Jimmy. I'd rather you continued, said Jimmy, white. You ran into the truck, your car swinging a little as it slid. The girder came through the windshield. It could have hit you. It could have missed both of you. By pure chance, it happened to hit Jane. And killed her, said Jimmy very quietly. Yes, but it might have been me. That diary entry is written as if it had been me. Did you notice? There was a long pause in Haynes's office. The world outside the windows was highly prosaic and commonplace and normal. Haynes wriggled in his chair. I think, he said unhappily, you did the same as my girl client, forged that writing and then forgot it. Have you seen a doctor yet? I will, said Jimmy. Systematize my lunacy for me first, Haynes, if it can be done. It's not accepted science, said Haynes. In fact, it's considered eyewash. But there have been speculations, he grimaced. First point is that it was pure chance that Jane was hit. It was just as likely to be you instead, or neither of you. If it had been you, Jane, said Jimmy, would be living in her house alone, and she might very well have written that entry in the diary. Yes, agreed Haynes uncomfortably. I shouldn't suggest this, but there are a lot of possible futures. We don't know which one will come about for us. Nobody except fatalists can argue with that statement. When today was in the future, there were a lot of possible todays. The present moment, now, is only one of any number of nows that might have been. So it's been suggested, mind you, this isn't accepted science, but pure charlatanry, it's been suggested that there may be more than one actual now. Before the girder actually hit, there were three nows in the possible future. One in which neither of you was hit, one in which you were hit, and one... He paused, embarrassed. So some people would say, how do we know that the one in which Jane was hit is the only now? They'd say that the others could have happened and that maybe they did. Jimmy nodded. If that were true he said detachedly. Jane would be in a present moment, and now, where it was me who was killed. As I'm in a now where she was killed, is that it? Haynes shrugged. Jimmy thought and said gravely, Thanks. Queer, isn't it? He picked up the two pictures and went out. Haynes was the only one who knew about the affair, and he worried. But it is not easy to denounce someone as insane when there is no evidence that he is apt to be dangerous. He did go to the trouble to find out that Jimmy acted in a reasonably normal manner, working industriously and talking quite sanely in the daytime. Only Haynes suspected that of nights he went home and experienced the impossible. Sometimes Haynes suspected that the impossible might be the fact that had been an amazingly good bit of trick photography, but it was too preposterous. Also, there was no reason for such a thing to happen to Jimmy. For a week after Haynes' pseudo-scientific explanation, however, Jimmy was almost light-hearted. He no longer had to remind himself that Jane was dead. He had evidence that she wasn't. She wrote to him in the diary which she found on her desk, and he read her messages and wrote in return. For a full week, the sheer joy of simply being able to communicate with each other was enough. The second week was not so good. To know that Jane was alive was good, but to be separated from her without hope was not. There was no meaning in a cosmos in which one could only write love letters to one's wife or husband in another now which only might have been... But for a while, both Jimmy and Jane tried to hide this new hopelessness from each other. Jimmy explained this carefully to Haynes before it was all over. Their letters were tender and very natural, and presently there was even time for gossip and actual bits of choice scandal. Haynes met Jimmy on the street one day, after about two weeks. Jimmy looked better, but he was drawn very fine. Though he greeted Haynes without constraint, Haynes felt awkward. After a little, he said, Uh, Jimmy... That matter we were talking about the other day, those photographs. Yes, you were right, said Jimmy casually. Jane agrees. There is more than one now. In the now I'm in, Jane was killed. In the now she's in, I was killed. Haynes fidgeted. Would you let me see that picture of the door again? He asked. A trick film like that simply can't be perfect. I'd like to enlarge that picture a little more. May I? You can have the film, said Jimmy. I don't need it any more. Haynes hesitated. Jimmy, quite matter-of-factly, told him most of what had happened to date, but he had no idea what had started it. Haynes almost wrung his hands. The thing can't be, he said desperately. You have to be crazy, Jimmy. But he would not have said that to a man whose sanity he really suspected. Jimmy nodded. 
Jane told me something, by the way. Did you have a near accident night before last? Somebody almost ran into you out on the sawmill road? Haynes started and went pale. I went around a curve and a car plunged out of nowhere on the wrong side of the road. We both swung hard. He smashed my fender and almost went off the road himself. But he went racing off without stopping to see if I'd gone in the ditch and killed myself. If I'd been five feet nearer the curve when he came out of it... Where Jane is, said Jimmy. You were. Just about five feet nearer the curve. It was a bad smash. Tony Shields was in the other car. It killed him where Jane is. Haynes licked his lips. It was absurd, but he said, How about me? Where Jane is, Jimmy told him, you're in the hospital. Haynes swore in unreasonable irritation. There wasn't any way for Jimmy to know about that near accident. He hadn't mentioned it, because he'd no idea who'd been in the other car. I don't believe it, but he said pleadingly. Jimmy, it isn't so, is it? How in hell could you account for it? Jimmy shrugged. Jane and I, we're rather fond of each other. The understatement was so patent that he smiled faintly. Chance separated us. The feeling we have for each other draws us together. There's a saying about two people becoming one flesh. If such a thing could happen, it would be Jane and me. After all, maybe only a tiny pebble or a single extra drop of water made my car swerve enough to get her killed, where I am, that is. That's a very little thing. So with such a trifle separating us, and so much pulling us together, why, sometimes the barrier wears thin. She leaves a door closed in the house where she is. I open that same door where I am. Sometimes I have to open the door she left closed, too. That's all. Haynes didn't say a word, but the question he wouldn't ask was so self-evident that Jimmy answered it. We're hoping, he said. It's pretty bad being separated, but the phenomena keep up. So we hope. Her diary is sometimes in the now where she is, and sometimes in this now of mine. Cigarette butts, too. Maybe... That was the only time he showed any sign of emotion. He spoke as if his mouth were dry. If ever I'm in her now, or she's in mine, even for an instant, all the devils in hell couldn't separate us again. We hope. Which was insanity. In fact, it was the third week of insanity. He'd told Haynes quite calmly that Jane's diary was on her desk every night, and there was a letter to him in it, and he wrote one to her. He said quite calmly that the barrier between them seemed to be growing thinner, that at least once, when he went to bed, he was sure that there was one more cigarette stub in the ashtray that had been there earlier in the evening. They were very near indeed. They were separated only by the difference between what was and what might have been. In one sense, the difference was a pebble or a drop of water. In another, the difference was that between life and death. But they hoped. They convinced themselves that the barrier grew thinner. Once it seemed to Jimmy that they touched hands, but he was not sure. He was still sane enough not to be sure and he told all this to Haynes in a matter-of-fact fashion, and speculated mildly on what had started it all. Then, one night, Haynes called Jimmy on the telephone. Jimmy answered. He sounded impatient. Jimmy, said Haynes. He was almost hysterical. I think I'm insane. You know you said Tony Shields was in the car that hit me? Yes, said Jimmy politely. What's the matter? It's been driving me crazy, wailed Haynes feverishly. You said he was killed, there but I hadn't told a soul about the incident. So, so just now I broke down and phoned him. And it was Tony Shields. That near crash scared him to death, and I gave him hell, and he's paying for my fender. I didn't tell him he was killed. Jimmy didn't answer. It didn't seem to matter to him. I'm coming over, said Haynes feverishly. I've got to talk. No, said Jimmy. Jane and I are pretty close to each other. We've touched each other again. We're hoping. The barrier's wearing through. We hope it's going to break. But it can't, protested Haynes, shocked at the idea of improbabilities in the preposterous. It, it, it can't. What would happen if you turned up where she is, or, or if she turned up here? I don't know, said Jimmy, but we'd be together. You're crazy, you mustn't. Goodbye, said Jimmy politely. I'm hoping, Haynes, something has to happen. It has to. His voice stopped. There was a noise in the room behind him. Haynes heard it, only two words and those faintly and over a telephone but he swore to himself that it was Jane's voice throbbing with happiness. The two words Haynes thought he heard were, Jimmy! Darling! Then the telephone crashed to the floor and Haynes heard no more. Even though he called back frantically again, Jimmy didn't answer. Haynes sat up all that night practically gibbering, and he tried to call Jimmy again next morning, and then tried his office, and at last went to the police. He explained to them that Jimmy had been in a highly nervous state since the death of his wife. So finally the police broke into the house. 
They had to break in because every door and window was carefully fastened from the inside, as if Jimmy had been very careful to make sure nobody could interrupt what he and Jane hoped would occur. But Jimmy wasn't in the house. There was no trace of him. It was exactly as if he had vanished into the air. Ultimately, the police dragged ponds and such things for his body, but they never found any clues. Nobody ever saw Jimmy again. It was recorded that Jimmy simply left town, and everybody accepted that obvious explanation. The thing that really bothered Haynes was the fact that Jimmy had told him who'd almost crashed into him on the sawmill road, and it was true. That was, to understate, hard to take. And there was the double exposure picture of Jimmy's front door, which was much more convincing than any other trick picture Haynes had ever seen. But on the other hand, if it did happen, why did it happen only to Jimmy and Jane? What set it off? What started it? Why, in effect, did those oddities start at that particular time to those particular people in that particular fashion? In fact, did anything happen at all? Now, after Jimmy's disappearance, Haynes wished he could talk with him once more, talk sensibly, quietly, without fear and hysteria, and this naggingly demanding wonderment. For he had sketched to Jimmy, and Jimmy had accepted, hadn't he, the possibility of the other now. But with that acceptance came still others. In one, Jane was dead. In one, Jimmy was dead. It was between these two that the barrier had grown so thin. If he could talk to Jimmy about it. There was also a now in which both had died, and another in which neither had died. And if it was togetherness that each wanted so desperately, which was it? These were things that Haynes would have liked very much to know, but he kept his mouth shut, or car men in white coats would have come and taken him away for treatment, as they would have taken Jimmy. The only thing really sure was that it was all impossible. But to someone who liked Jimmy and Jane, and doubtless to Jimmy and to Jane themselves, no matter which barrier had been broken, it was a rather satisfying impossibility. Haynes's car had been repaired. He could easily have driven out to the cemetery. For some reason, he never did. If you're enjoying the stories, please activate the like button for this video. It helps me create more content like this. Dream World by R. A. Lafferty Narrated by William Skye It was the awfulest dream in the world, no doubt about it. In fact, it seemed to be the only dream there was. He was a morning type, so it was unusual that he should feel depressed in the morning. He tried to account for it, and could not. He was a healthy man, so he ate a healthy breakfast. He was not too depressed for that. And he listened unconsciously to the dark girl with the musical voice. Often she ate at Cahill's in the mornings with her girlfriend. Grape juice, pineapple juice, orange juice, apple juice. Why did people look at him suspiciously just because he took four or five sorts of juice for breakfast? Agnes, it was ghastly. I was built like a sack. A sack full of skunk cabbage, I swear. And I was green-brown colour and had hair like a latrine mop. Agnes, I was sick with misery. It just isn't possible for anybody to feel so low. I can't shake it at all and the whole world was like the underside of a log. It wasn't that, though. It wasn't just one bunch of things. It was everything. It was a world where things just weren't worth living. I can't come out of it. Teresa, it was only a dream. Sausage, only four little links for an order. Did people think he was a glutton because he had four orders of sausage? It didn't seem like very much. My mother was a monster. She was a warthogish animal, and yet she was still recognisable. How could my mother look like a warthog and still look like my mother? Mama's pretty. Teresa, it was only a dream. Forget it. The stairs a man must suffer just to get a dozen pancakes on his plate. What was the matter with people who called four pancakes a tall stack? And what was odd about ordering a quarter of a pound of butter? It was better than having twenty of those little pats, each on its coaster. Agnes, we all of us had eyes that bugged out, and we stank. We were bloated, and all the time it rained a dirty green rain that smelled like a four-letter word. Good grief, girl. We had hair all over us where we weren't warts, and we talked like cracked crows. We had crawlers. I itched just from thinking about it. And the dirty parts of the dream I won't even tell you. I've never felt so blue in my life. I just don't know how I'll make the day through. Teresa, doll, how could a dream upset you so much? There isn't a thing wrong with ordering three eggs sunny side up, and three over easy, and three poached ever so soft, and six of them scrambled, 
What law says a man should have all of his eggs fixed alike? Nor is there anything wrong with ordering five cups of coffee. That way the girl doesn't have to keep running over with refills. Bascom Swicegood liked to have bacon and waffles after the egg interlude and the earlier courses. But he was nearly at the end of his breakfast when he jumped up. What did she say? He was surprised at the violence of his own voice. What did who say, Mr. Swicegood? The girl that was just here, that just left with the other girl. That was Teresa, and the other girl was Agnes. Or else that was Agnes and the other girl was Teresa. It depends on which girl you mean. I don't know what either of them said. Bascom ran out into the street. Girl, the girl who said it rained dirty green all the time. What's your name? My name is Teresa. You've met me four times. Every morning you look like you never saw me before. I'm Agnes, said Agnes. What did you mean it rained dirty green all the time? Tell me all about it. I will not, Mr. Swicegood. I was just telling a dream I had to Agnes. It isn't any of your business. Well, I have to hear all of it. Tell me everything you dreamed. I will not. It was a dirty dream. It isn't any of your business. If you weren't a friend of my uncle Ed Kelly, I'd call a policeman for your bothering me. Did you have things like live rats in your stomach to digest for you? Did they... Oh! How did you know? Get away from me. I will call a policeman. Mr. McCarty, this man is annoying me. The devil he is, Miss Ananias. Old Bascom just doesn't have it in him any more. There's no more harm in him than a lamppost. Did the lampposts have hair on them, Miss Teresa? Did they pant and swell and smell green? Oh, you couldn't know, you awful man. I'm Agnes, said Agnes, but Teresa dragged Agnes away with her. What is the lamppost jag, Bascom? asked Officer Mossback McCarty. Ah, I know what it is like to be in hell, Mossback. I dreamed of it last night. And well you should, a man who neglects his Easter duty year after year. But the lamppost jag, if it concerns anything on my beat, I have to know about it. It seems that I have the same depressing dream as the young lady, identical in every detail. Not knowing what dreams are, and we do not know, we should not find it strange that two people might have the same dream. There may not be enough of them to go around, and most dreams are forgotten in the morning. Bascom Swicegood had forgotten his dismal dream. He could not account for his state of depression until he heard Teresa Ananias telling pieces of her own dream to Agnes Schoenapfel. Even then it came back to him slowly at first, but afterwards with a rush. The oddity wasn't that two people should have the same dream, but that they should discover the coincidence, what with thousands of people running around and most of the dreams forgotten. Yet, if it were a coincidence, it was a multiplex one. On the night when it was first made manifest, it must have been dreamed by quite a number of people in one medium-large city. There was a small piece in an afternoon paper. One doctor had five different worried patients who had had dreams of rats in their stomachs and hair growing on the insides of their mouths. This was the first publication of the shared dream phenomenon. The squib did not mention the foul green rain background, but later investigation uncovered that this and other details were common to the dreams. But it was a reporter named Willie Wagoner who really put the town on the map. Until he did the job, the incidents and notices had been isolated. Dr. Jerome Judas had been putting together some notes on the green rain syndrome. Dr. Florence Appian had been working up his evidence on the Surex ventriculus trauma and Professor Gideon Greathouse had come to some learned conclusions on the inner meaning of warts. But it was Willie Wagoner who went to the people for it, and then gave his conclusions back to the people. Willie said that he had interviewed a thousand people at random. He hadn't really, he had talked to about twenty. It takes longer than you might think to interview a thousand people. He reported that slightly more than 67% had had a dream of the same repulsive world. He reported that more than 44% had had the dream more than once, 32% more than twice, 27% more than three times. Many had had it every damn night, and many refused frostily to answer questions on the subject at all. This was ten days after Bascom Swicegood had heard Teresa Ananias tell her dream to Agnes. Willie published the opinions of the three learned gentlemen above, and the theories and comments of many more. He also appended a hatful of answers he had received that were sheer levity. But the phenomenon was not local. Wagoner's article was the first comprehensive, or at least wordy, treatment of it, but only by hours. Similar things were in other papers that very afternoon, and the next day. It was more than a fad. Those who called it a fad fell silent after they themselves experienced the dream. 
The suicide index arose around the country and the world. The thing was now international. The cacophonous ditty Green Rain was on all the jukes, as was the warthog song. People began to loathe themselves and each other. Women feared that they would give birth to monsters. There were new perversions committed in the name of the thing, and several orgiastic societies were formed with the stomach rat as a symbol. All entertainment was forgotten, and this was the only topic. Nervous disorders took a fearful rise as people tried to stay awake to avoid the abomination, and as they slept in spite of themselves and suffered the degradation. It is no joke to experience the same loathsome dream all night every night. It had actually come to that. All the people were dreaming it all night every night. It had passed from being a joke to being a universal menace. Even the sudden new millionaires who rushed their cures to the market were not happy. They also suffered whenever they slept, and they knew that their cures were not cures. There were large amounts posted for anyone who could cure the populace of the warthog people dreams. There was presidential edict and dictator decree, and military teams attacked the thing as a military problem, but they were not able to subdue it. Then, one night, a nervous lady heard a voice in her noisome dream. It was one of the repulsive cracked warthog voices. You are not dreaming, said the voice. This is the real world, but when you wake, you will be dreaming. That barefaced world is not a world at all, it is only a dream. This is the real world. The lady awoke howling, and she had not howled before, for she was a demure lady. Nor was she the only one who awoke howling. There were hundreds, then thousands, then millions. The voice spoke to all and engendered a doubt. Which was the real world? Almost equal time was now spent in each, for the people had come to need more sleep, and most of them had arrived at spending a full twelve hours or more in the nightmarish world. It could be, was the title of a headlined article on the subject by the same Professor Greathouse mentioned above. It could be, he said, that the world on which the green rain fell incessantly was the real world. It could be that the warthogs were real and the people a dream. It could be that rats in the stomach were normal, and other methods of digestion were chimerical. And then a very great man went on the air in worldwide broadcast with a speech that was a ringing call for collective sanity. It was the hour of decision, he said. The decision would be made. Things were at an exact balance, and the balance would be tipped. But we can decide one way or the other. We will decide. I implore you all in the name of sanity that you decide right. One world or the other will be the world of tomorrow. One of them is real, and one of them is a dream. Both are with us now, and the favour can go to either. But listen to me here. Whichever one wins, the other, will have always been a dream. A momentary madness soon forgotten. I urge you to the sanity which in a measure I have lost myself. Yet in our darkened dilemma, I feel that we yet have a choice. Choose! And perhaps that was the turning point. The mad dream disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared. The world came back to normal with an embarrassed laugh. It was all over. It had lasted from its inception six weeks. Bascom Swicegood, a morning type, felt excellent this morning. He breakfasted at Cahill's and he ordered heavily as always, and he listened with half an ear to the conversation of two girls at the table next to his. But I should know you, he said. Of course, I'm Teresa. I'm Agnes, said Agnes. Mr. Swicegood, how could you forget? It was when the dreams first came and you overheard me telling mine to Agnes. Then you ran after us in the street because you had had the same dream, and I wanted to have you arrested. Weren't they horrible dreams? And have they ever found out what caused them? They were horrible, and they have not found out. They ascribe it to group mania, which is meaningless. And now there are those who say that the dreams never came at all, and soon they will be nearly forgotten. But the horror of them! The loneliness! Yes, we hadn't even particularly to curry our body hair. We almost hadn't had any body hair. Teresa was an attractive girl. She had a cute trick of popping the smallest rat out of her mouth so it could see what was coming into her stomach. She was bulbous and beautiful. Like a sack full of skunk cabbage, Bascom murmured admiringly in his head, and then flushed green at his forwardness of phrase. Teresa had protuberances upon protuberances, and warts on warts, and hair all over her where she wasn't warts and bumps. Like a latrine mop, sighed Bascom with true admiration. 
The cracked clang of Teresa's voice was music in the early morning. All was right with the earth again. Gone the hideous nightmare world when people had stood barefaced and lonely, without bodily friends or dependents. Gone that ghastly world of the sick blue sky and the near absence of entrancing odour. Bascom attacked manfully his plate of prime carrion, and outside the pungent green rain fell incessantly. The Furious Rose by Dean Evans Narrated by William Skye This world was a set-up for any man who wanted to get along, provided one had enough victims to toss to the wolves. The master clock on the black desk in the Office of Federal Executions made a quiet blipping sound. Immediately the lights lowered to a moat neutral. Long probing shadow fingers snaked here and there across the floor, and a silence that should have been restful, and wasn't, descended on the place. Tony Radek leaned back in his chair and frowned. One fifteen in the morning. At one fifteen in the morning, no man, no matter who, should be going to his nega moat. Why not hang a man instead? Or electrocute him? Or gas him the way they used to back in the old days? In those old days his grandfather used to talk about, where twelve ordinary citizens said the word that peeled the life off a man like skinning an onion. He sighed softly and folded his hands across a tiny paunch that was just beginning to show. Tony Raddock was getting old. He was a safe now. That meant he needn't worry about the war any longer. He was a nice, mild, peaceable gentleman who stayed at home and thought beautiful thoughts about the younger men out in space. A man his age didn't feel anger and hate and retribution and lust and treachery any more. He was just a little old fat guy. He was the federal executioner. He frowned again and leaned forward and touched a naked button on the desktop. That lit up the screen on his left. Not the master screen, which was the one on his right. This was the other, the one that could tell him what was going on outside the office, outside in portal waiting, where certain peculiar ghouls, who derived a measure of excitement from the executions, were allowed by the gracious state to hang out. He stared at the screen. His frown deepened. Portal waiting should be bare and vacant at this hour, but it wasn't. This was the third night in a row that it wasn't. There was a girl out there. A quiet girl. A girl who looked about as ghoulish as one of the nice red ritual roses over in the cooler built into the wall. Damn the dame, why didn't she go home? Tony Raddock's upper lip lifted a little, showing small angry teeth. At once the emote neutral lights in the office flickered wildly. Tony pulled his eyes from the screen and glared up at the lights. That's progress for you. Let a man go on one little momentary emotional binge, like this, and right away spies in the joint start screaming. In a moment now, the one on his right, the master screen, would blink into life and old Hell Hips himself would start poking around asking questions. Just see if it didn't. He turned his head to the right, stared at the master screen, and waited. The screen blazed into life. A narrow-faced man with washed-away eyes that looked as though they'd seen sin and hadn't liked it peered angrily over toward Tony behind the desk. Mr. Raddick! He had a thin, thin voice that sounded like a sheet of paper slitting down the middle. What's going on down there? Can't you control your own office? Or maybe you'd like to be back in training? The eyes squinted sharply. Tony worked up an innocent look. He spread his hands on the black surface of the desk smiled, and said mildly, Out of your mind. My lights have been as steady as old emote neutral herself. Probably that blonde you got central direction kitted into thinking you need as an assistant. Probably you sneaked up on her when she was in personal lock and... What? The master screen trembled a little and the narrow-faced man's eyes seemed to jerk out of registration for a moment. Look here, Radek. I've stood just about enough of your insinuations. Look who's making the lights flicker now, said Tony calmly. He waved an arm around the office. Emote neutral was flickering rapidly as though controlled by an interrupter switch. Central direction should see this, he observed. He stared briefly at the contorted face on the screen. That face was working convulsively now, getting red like the ritual roses over in the cooler. He snorted disgustedly reached forward and touched the mat switch which threw the master screen into Visi lock. At once the screen darkened and all sound left the office. 
That was more like it. Let old hell hips up in supplies and control stew if he wanted. There wasn't anything in the Constitution, not even the old Constitution, that said a man had to sit and look at him. Central direction to Raddock, a hard voice rapped out of the alternate speaker over in the corner. Tony Raddock jerked, spun around. He swallowed quickly, said nervously. Yes, sir? Raddock, you're violating Ordinance 6, Code 325, Division of Security. Unlock that Vizzy screen at once. Yes, sir. Tony's hand flew to the mat switch, pulled it. Sorry, elbow must have hit it accidentally. Didn't know it was locked. Raddock, there's a war on. That Vizzy lock must be used only in emergency. You know that. Yes, sir. Like I said, I heard. In the future, be a little more careful. And Raddock? Yes, sir. Ready cell two. Execution at one twenty seven. John Edward Haley. Convicted of mass interference of morale, city of Greater New Denver, as outlined under Congressional Act of April twelve, twenty two fifty. Decision rendered equally on all three final master machines. No appeal? asked Tony very softly. No appeal. And Radek? Yes, sir. The condemned is married. Check with supplies and control for bill of divorcement. His wife is a young woman. We'll have to marry again in the morning, as outlined under Congressional Act of May 28, 2211. Got that? Yes, sir. The master screen went dead. Tony blinked. Bill of divorcement. We'll have to marry again in the morning, as outlined under Congressional Act. By God, that's progress for you. He sat staring at the master screen for a long time. Then he sighed, punched the button on supplies and control. Hell hips, he growled. Snap it up. Execution at one twenty seven. Bill of divorcement. The narrow face peered sourly out at him from the master screen. It didn't have much emotion in it now. It was almost blank, like the face of a human eyed robot somebody'd left something out of. Been hit in the bottle again, huh? said Tony. My name is Clacker, Mr. Ruddick. Arthur Jarrett Clacker. Kindly keep that in mind when you address me. Sure, sure. Nice name. Lovely name. Sounds like a stone boat going over ground glass. Whip up that bill of divorcement. It's ready, Mr. Raddock. Been ready for the last half hour. I suggest that if there were a little of my own well-known and demonstrated efficiency in your office, perhaps executions would be something to be proud of. Instead of what it is. Instead of the foul-smelling, sloppily-run, lice-infested... Tony's hand reached out for the button on supplies and control. Watch those lights, he said tiredly. He got up from the desk, stretched a little, and went across the office to the cooler in the opposite wall. His feet made no noise. He had that quiet tread that all cats, a few men, and some women achieve. His hand interrupted the automatic cell guard and a tiny, almost hidden door in the wall swung wide. He reached up, poked his hand in the cooler, felt around. A little smile came into his eyes. He took his hand out of the cooler, got up on tiptoes and looked inside. No roses. Not even one rose. Not even half of a rose. Chuckling, he went back to the desk and jabbed a finger at the button over supplies and control. Hell hips, he rapped. Where's all that well-known and demonstrated efficiency I've had to rake out of my ears? The narrow face lit up the master screen once more. It looked bored now. Mr. Raddick, there was something? Yeah, something. Tony's voice dropped, got deadly soft. How many weeks since you checked the cooler, boy? There aren't any ritual roses. There... there aren't any? That's right, Mr. Clacker. Now get away from that screen. I'm reporting this to Central Direction. His finger jammed down on the supplies and control button. He watched the master screen go blank and grinned. He thought, shake a little, Mr. Clacker, shake a little, because he didn't dare even whisper to himself. He sat down at the desk again and thought of something. His finger went out, touched the button on the screen on the left the portal waiting screen. She was still there, hunched up in one of the chairs like a small child somebody had left in an interplanet waiting room and then gone away and forgotten. Tony frowned once more. Damn that dame, she was spoiling his nights. He got up, crossed the office on silent feet, opened the door of executions, went down a bare silent hall. At the levelators he waited a moment for the platform, took it down, got off again at portal waiting and crossed to the foyer. She was there, just as she'd been on the screen upstairs, only clearer, more vivid, something witnessed instead of second-hand, something with dimension to it. 
She was in a big chair that could have accommodated two like her. She had her legs tucked under her, and her brown eyes that looked up at Tony's approach weren't any larger than two full moons. He said, Are you Mrs. John Haley? The girl nodded. They... they've got Johnny. I know. Tony dropped into a chair opposite the girl. It's late, he said softly. You shouldn't be here this time of night, Mrs. Haley. The girl thought about that. You're Mr. Radek, aren't you? In the execution office. Call me Tony, Mrs. Haley. All right, Tony. Yes, it's late. I hadn't noticed, but I suppose you're right. You should go home, Mrs. Haley. He stopped, then lied a little. They'll let you know. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. They're bringing the guy up now, little girl. But you don't have to worry. Old Hell Hips is getting a ritual rose now, little girl. But you don't have to worry. As if he'd deliberately telepathed the thought, the girl said suddenly, Tony... Is is it true about the furious roses? I mean, if a man is found guilty, do they... The furious roses, Mrs. Haley? He smiled. I see. You mean because they're so red? Yes, it's true. Ritual roses, we call them. But that's nothing. Nothing at all. A custom only. A symbol handed down. It means nothing. I know. The girl nodded again. When we were children, we always called them the furious roses because they were a furious red. We always used to say that if an innocent man was executed, the furious red rose would right away turn white, Tony, to show they'd been wrong about him. He shrugged. Bedtime stories, Mrs. Haley. Not not that it means anything to me, Tony. They'll find Johnny innocent, of course. All three machines. The final machines. Innocent? Oh, sure. A man, said Tony with a vague motion of his hands. What's the difference what man or woman has? In the morning there's always another, and another name. What's the difference? He smiled a small toy smile with eyes half closed so the girl couldn't look too closely into them. But it was all right. She hadn't heard. At least she wasn't bawling those big eyes of hers at him. She was looking down into her folded hands. He continued. There's a war on, Mrs. Haley. It seems there's always a war on somehow. And everybody, you, me, the guy down the street who skins ships for a living, we all have to remember that. And yet some of us don't. Some of us go off on a tangent and try to sell out our country, and then there's hell to pay. And if we're found guilty, we get the execution. The negamote. The girl's lips began to tremble. She looked up. Does it hurt, Tony? I mean, physically? No, of course not. A corner of his mouth curled. We're humane nowadays, hadn't you heard? We just strap a man in a chair and press a button and down comes a metal hood over him. We press some more buttons and pull a switch or two, and that's that. No feeling, nothing. The man's as good as new, except he has no emotions any more. No emotions whatsoever, except personal physical pain, such as he'd need in case somebody stepped on his toe or jabbed him with a pin. The state wants us to protect ourselves, you see. It wouldn't want us getting hurt because we don't feel anything. He stopped because it was getting harder to continue. We used to call it stripping, but that was long ago before the humane boys decided the term was a little cruel. Now it's just negamoting, but the same thing, just a fancy title. Her big eyes were suddenly eating into his. What did they do with them, Tony? He shrugged again. Send them off to training. Some can be taught this, some that, but a living death, nevertheless. What else can a traitor expect? The girl began to tremble all over. Not Johnny... They can't do that to Johnny. He's innocent, Tony. He didn't do anything. Tony, tell them that. Tell them to let him go. He put his teeth together hard. What do you say to a woman who sits across from you waiting the long, long wait? What do you say to a woman like this when you see the terror, and something else, in eyes like hers? You like the guy, Mrs. Haley? He asked gently. That's old-fashioned as hell, you know. We all learn that way back in primaries. But the woman wasn't listening again, wasn't caring what he'd said. She began to whisper very softly. In the nights I used to be frightened. I used to lie there asleep and dream of the ships coming down and spraying the house with the burn waves. And I could hear the roaring thunder of the jets and the house would start to shake and I'd try to yell, but I couldn't. Something inside would be choking me. And just when the burn waves would be coming hot through the window and licking at the walls inside the room, I'd scream myself awake and jump up in bed and the sweat would be pouring off me. 
Tony stared, incredulous, into the big balls of fright that her eyes had become. And then the lights would come on again, and there would be Johnny lying next to me, smiling a little, and his curly hair would be all tussled from sleep. And he'd say to me, Baby, you've been dreaming again. Don't you know I'm here? Don't you know I'll always be here? Don't you know that, baby? And then it would be all right, and the roaring jets would be only the dawn shift going out on security patrol and then I could go back to sleep again. She stopped. Portal waiting had become a grey ghost of a thing with nothing living in it, only the clouds of memory like smoke veils swirling, drifting here and there, soon gone. And then, they'll let him go, Tony. He's innocent, you know. They have to let him go. He didn't look at her. He got up from his chair, put his hands rigidly at his sides. Then he did look, just once and very hard. Get out of here, he growled. No, Tony. He took a deep breath, turned, went across the foyer to the levelators. As he passed under the huge master screen, her voice came again, but quite thin. You'll let me know, Tony. You'll let me know as soon as you get word. He didn't answer, didn't look back, didn't do anything except keep going to the levelators. He went upstairs, found the door of executions, opened it, went through, let it slam shut. Things started to happen. The master clock over on the black desk made a quiet blipping sound and the emote neutral lights went out. At once the office was flooded with amber official, the working lights. Then the master screen glowed and a narrow-faced man with washed-away eyes looked out at him. Condemned is waiting, Mr. Raddick, the narrow-faced man said acidly. Cell two is getting dusty waiting for you, Mr. Raddick. Very dusty. Tony looked up. His heart wasn't in it, but he said it anyhow. Go chase your blonde some more hell hips. He went over to the desk, banged the supplies and control button, held it down. Master screen darkened. He looked at the small square of white paper on the black desk top. A bill of divorcement, like that. So in the morning the kid downstairs could go out and get herself another mate, and then she could go back to bed again and dream some more about the roaring jets and the burn waves. He reached up and wiped at his forehead. She didn't have to see it happen. Nothing in the Constitution, old or new, stated she had to see it happen. He looked down at the mat switch that controlled the visi lock on the master screen. He clamped his teeth together, and his hand went out and flipped the switch. The office went dead. Maybe nobody'd notice. Maybe he'd have time to slip into cell two and get it over with before anybody noticed. He started across the room on fast, silent feet. Radek! The alternate speaker over in the corner blasted out. He froze solid. Radek, don't move! Stand where you are! Don't move? He couldn't have moved if he'd had jets on. And then the hard voice went on again. Central command to supplies and control. Use emergency visi relay. Unlock the master screen. This is command 419, regulation 4. Signed, countersigned. Almost at once the master screen flickered into life and a hard, severe-looking face appeared there. Radek, turn around. Face the screen. Yes, sir. Tony turned. Second violation, Radek. Why? Tony forced a blank face. He lifted his shoulders, said, I was over here on my way to cell two for the execution. How could I... That will be all, Radek. Clear your desk. Prepare for judgment on final machines. Tony swallowed. He didn't move because he couldn't move. Well, Radek? He fought his face clean, kept his hands rigid at his sides. Sweat was rolling down his back, but that was all right. Central Command couldn't be expected to see sweat roll down a man's back under his clothing, though a lot of people thought so. A suggestion, sir, he said at last. What? Hard eyes bored into his own. He let a little anxious look creep over his face. Not a guilty look, he hoped, but the kind of anxious look a worried but innocent man might have in a spot like this. He said quickly, About that visi lock, I suggest it might have gone into lock by itself. You see, it's one of the old-fashioned kind, the type they used to have that worked with solenoids. We've had trouble with them before. That brought a little silence. The hard eyes in the screen said at last, Central Command to Supplies and Control. Is the visi lock in executions controlled by a solenoid? Was it never changed to relay? Tony gulped. He looked into the master screen, but he remained frozen to the floor, hardly breathing. And then a very thin voice answered nervously, I, I believe that's correct, sir. I believe Executions does have the old-fashioned solenoid. It seems there hasn't been time to change it. 
I've been intending to... The voice was cut off. The hard eyes came back to Tony. Decision, the hard voice said. Yes, sir. Exonerated, Raddick. Carry on with execution in cell two. The screen went blank. Tony shuddered. A close one. A damned close one. That was the war for you. Even a man's breaths accounted. He went on shaky feet over to the cooler, reached in, got out a ritual rose, left the office and shuffled down the hall to cell two. John Edward Haley, the condemned. A thin man, Tony thought. Well, sure, there aren't many fat men anymore. Not in ordinary circumstances, that is. The man was sitting tensely in the chair. There was no one else in the cell, which was as it should be, of course. Witnesses, yes, the master screen up on the wall, but not here, not visible. Tony went across the cell. John Edward Haley, he said. The man moved a nervous tongue over dry lips. John Edward Haley, you have been sentenced for execution. Now hear these final words of the state as directed by presidential order from responsibility official in the city of Greater New Denver this night. He took two small steps toward the man in the chair. He held out the red rose, put it in the hand of the other. Then he stepped back, two steps until his toes were just touching a small plaque built into the floor. He looked down, red from the plaque. The giving of this rose, a symbol for the red of the blood of your brothers that you have let by treason and or treachery. A symbol that as the rose is red, so are the unclean acts of your own hand, of your own mind. The state has so spoken. He looked up. A nice way to kiss a guy off. Might as well tell him he bit his brother's fingers too when he was a kid. Have you anything to say? he asked. The man's nervous tongue worked again. He said quickly. Yeah, look guy, just one thing. Just one favour. I don't give a damn what happens to me. Sure, I'm guilty. So you caught me, and so I take it. So what? A guy expects that. But the wife? Tony's teeth came together hard. But the wife, see? She's down in portal waiting. Been there for three nights now. I don't want her to witness this. I don't want her to look into that master screen down there and see it. That's all I'm asking, guy. And it ain't much. Just a flick of a switch is all I'm asking. It ain't much. It ain't, is it? It ain't, eh? By God. When the hood comes down, she'll see it. She's bound to the thin man went on fast. She'll see the flash in the screen and she'll know it's me. And she's never done anything to deserve that. That's all I'm asking, Guy. That's all I'm asking. The silence in the cell was a thick thing. Tony could feel the sweat rolling down his back again. But a different kind of a sweat now. Not a sweat for himself, a sweat for somebody else. Just one finger touch on that fizzy lock mat switch would do it. Just one finger and the small woman downstairs in portal waiting wouldn't know would have one more instant of waiting, of hoping against hope, of suspense, of breathing in the air we all breathe in, of being alive, sentient, and knowing that her man, the thin fellow with the tussled curly hair, was still sentient too. Well, Guy? Tony wet his lips. Sorry, Haley. Petition refused. The hood came down. The master screen up on the wall blazed into life. Tony sat at his black desk with his hands folded, fingers laced. That's executions for you. And this is war. There's a war on, don't forget that. He looked down at his hands, sighed. Then he reached out and touched the supplies and control button. Hell hips, he growled. He looked at the screen. It wasn't hell hips, it was a blonde. Not a young blonde, a scarecrow blonde, an old wretched piece of living mechanism like himself. Where's Clacker? he asked. Mr. Clacker is no longer with us, Mr. Raddick. Huh? What happened to him? Mr. Clacker's been taken to the three final machines for trial and judgment. I am now taking over here. My name is Hortens G. Welker Hortens. Tony looked at the blonde. Crude, undisguised lights were coming from the woman's eyes. Promotion happy. He said at last, Sorry as hell about that. The solenoid thing, I suppose. I didn't mean to get the guy in trouble. I sure didn't mean that. He'd been ordered to change it. It was no one's fault but his own. You are only doing your duty, I'm sure, and duty comes above everything. Yeah, yeah, sure, I know. He sighed once more. Get me an airbrush and a bottle of white paint. What? I want an airbrush and a bottle of white paint. I want to paint my nice little ritual roses. I don't like red any more. I want all white ones. Mr. Radek, Tony glared. Do I get that paint or don't I? Don't just stand there. His fist banged down on supplies and control button. 
The master screen went blank and then flashed into motion again fast. The blonde again, nasty now, a chip off the old block. Another hell hips, but this time with skirts. Request not granted. This is entirely against regulations, Mr. Raddick. Specifically against Ordinance 1991 of the Code of... Oh, can it, he growled wearily. For God's sake, don't give me any more of that. The blonde stiffened. Well, after all, I'm only doing my duty, Mr. Raddick. As head of supplies and control, I have certain well-defined and inflexible... Tony blacked her out. He held her blacked out until he was sure she wouldn't come on again. Duty. The master clock made a quiet blipping noise. Amber official lights dimmed and emote neutral came on. Long, probing shadow fingers snaked here and there across the floor, and a stillness that should have been restful descended eventually on the place. Radek! The hard eyes. The hard voice. Tony looked into the screen. Yes, sir? Radek, that woman is still downstairs in portal waiting. We can't have her hanging around all night. Why hasn't she been given her bill of divorcement and sent home? My God, man, where's your feelings? She's at least entitled to that. Right away, sir, I was just going. He picked up the square of white paper. He pushed back his chair, got to his feet, went across the office, taking those peculiar, quiet little steps of his. Yes, sir, just going, sir. On my way, sir. Because, sir, as you've pointed out so clearly, sir, she's at least entitled to that. Thanks for watching and listening to this video. For more science fiction and fantasy stories like these, make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out the videos appearing on screen now.